Welcome back into Carbs Corner here, diving into some more of the big college football topics, things from the weekend, what we learned, what we figured out. And as always, this was a really great college football weekend. No ranked versus ranked, but don't let that get you down. There were still some fantastic games and ones that I think people kind of anticipated, ones you saw coming, and then a couple of games too that kind of threw you for a loop. And so we'll break some of that stuff down, talk a little bit about how punitive and crazy uh, some of these different uh, penalties and rules can be in college football, why some of these things get to need to change. And then obviously as well, the overtime situation, I understand what's going on. I understand why they're changing it for safety, but ultimately we want to have a nice high quality game and you want to make sure that the most deserving team wins. And now I'm not saying that that didn't happen this weekend, but what I am looking at and trying to understand is I think there could be some games where people will have some issues with the outcome because the overtime system, which I think people put in to make it better, I think ultimately could have made it worse. And I, I do like the college football overtime system, at least how it was for a long time for the most part. And especially when you had to start going for two after uh, into your third overtime. Uh, but looking at some of the games this week, um, Oregon, uh, UCLA, that was a game you know, top 10 team in the country taking on a team uh, that was unranked with Chip Kelly. And I thought UCLA was playing some really good football you know, coming into this. They've had some struggles, obviously, earlier this year. They've got, you know, the big victory um, over LSU to start the season. But they, Chip Kelly has, has this team performing and running the football at a pretty high clip. Um, you know, DTR has been doing, did a pretty good job for him. You know, their quarterback, they ask a lot of him to go out there and play and get it done with his legs, getting it done through the air. You know, they had the big lead. All of a sudden, uh, UCLA or Oregon comes storming back and takes it, and they are right there at the very end. And then you, know, you have a reserve quarterback coming in, throws an interception to, to finish off the game. Obviously a very, very heartbreaking situation if you were a Bruins fan. But I think Chip Kelly is doing something there at UCLA. He's been there for a couple of years. They haven't had the success that they thought they probably would initially. But the program wasn't in a great spot. I think he has taken it to some new, new heights right now, and they're beginning to build – uh, to where it is. They're getting an, inf an infusion of talent and they're running the football and they're running the football pretty well. And you know, if you think Oregon is the best team in the Pac-12, for whatever that's worth, then you would have to look at UCLA and say they're they're right on their heels. They're coming. And you had game day out there. I was impressed too with it because I'd been told, you know, Brock, you and I had talked a little bit doing my XM show that, you know, hey, I, like, I see these Pac-12 games. There's hardly anyone at some of them. He's like, well, People go to Oregon games, they go to Washington games, they go to Utah games. And, you know, while the Rose Bowl wasn't full and while they have a decent percentage of it tarped off, it still seemed like there was some passion there. There's still fans out there in the morning getting out there at 6 o'clock for game day, local time on the West Coast. So I respect that. And maybe we'll begin to see a little bit of resurgence of football out on the West Coast. Who knows? Uh, but it's exciting to kind of see that, and hopefully that will continue to grow. Because that's the one thing, man. The, the West Coast, like the UCLA's, Stanford's, the Oregon's, uh, the USC's. Like, I enjoy college football when those teams are better. It's no fun to me when you don't have something. I know that we're going to talk about inclusion and all this stuff. Like, I don't care about, you know, that. I, I want everybody who are the traditional powers or schools that have been good. I, I want them to continue to be good and to be national players in the college football race. So the, the Pac-12 hasn't been involved with that in a while. And hopefully now they're beginning to kind of creep back into that conversation because you can't just have one good team. And, me, you know, two, okay. You know, you, you think Oregon should be good. USC should be good. Hopefully you get UCLA entering the fray. And based upon what I saw on Saturday, I think Chip Kelly has that thing headed in the right direction uh, rolling. Another couple games I want to jump into, service academies. It's been a long time. And when I say long time, meaning probably before the advent of the previous button, that I'm sitting there in the early slate window, and I'm oscillating back and forth between two service academies, Navy, Cincinnati taking on Navy up there, and then uh, Army uh, getting a visit from Wake Forest. And watching going back between those two games, I thought this was the week the Wake Forest finally lost. They were three-point favorites to Army, and their run defense wasn't great, and it turns out their run defense was atrocious. Uh, but you know, Wake didn't do it, or Army didn't do enough good job, good enough job on the back end. They gave up a bunch of big plays 
I mean, the rushing numbers and total yardage numbers in that game was ridiculous. It was 70 to 56 for a team that wants to run the football and this big play after big play ripping stuff off. So flipping back between that and then Cincinnati, Cincinnati takes down the midshipmen 27 to 20, finds a way to get it done. And for Cincinnati at that point, with that game, it's a survive and advance thing. And I don't think voters ever hold service academy wins against teams if they're closer than maybe what you expected because everyone understands a service academy you're playing that triple option it is a game isolated unto itself no preparation goes into it that it works for other teams nothing comes out of it that you're going to be able to really use for other teams and so the service academy product like as long as you win the game i think the voters for the most part say we're not going to penalize you because you took the credit, you scheduled one of these teams. Maybe they're in conference. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a non-conference game. But you're playing a team that not many people want to play simply due to the style. Guys firing off, cutting your guys at the legs. Doesn't feel good. But going back and forth, Cincinnati gets to win. Wake gets to win. They both survive and advance against uh, Navy and Army, respectively. So moving forward. But I thought it was an unbelievable moment as I'm sitting there flipping back, you know, between uh, the two – traditional service academies who in the 50s you'd been all over that um, but they probably didn't even have tv remotes then and they definitely didn't have the previous button so uh it, nice to see the academies playing well and it's good to see those two other uh, wake forest continue to win interesting to see kind of how it plays out and you know their showdown with Pitt, what that could potentially look like uh as Pitt. i never thought i would see this two Two quarterbacks that were Heisman Trophy favorites to win the season. Big national media deals with DJ Uwe Ungale and Spencer Rattler. Oklahoma, Clemson. Both guys, big-time recruits. Huge expectations. Spencer Rattler was the odds-on favorite, and DJ wasn't far behind him to be able to win the Heisman. People thought Spencer would be the number one overall pick this year, and it looked like that was going to be the case. He ultimately gets usurped uh, by... You know, Caleb Williams, they bench him, who we'll get to him in a minute, and how uh, Oklahoma fared and how they were able to kind of, uh, you know, not maybe fall further in the rankings. Bama jumps him, but we'll get to that. Uh, but both of those guys, and this is the one thing about the NIL, as we'll talk a little bit of NIL as we jump all over the place here with my stream of consciousness. You know, everyone was worried this was going to be the Wild West, and I think it was at the beginning. I think it was the Wild West. But it was only going to take a couple of these players not panning out on major investments. I mean, DJ has the fans villain, uh, Dr. Pepper endorsement. I'm not sure what that pays, but it's a healthy six figures. And it might be a multi-year deal. And so I'm not saying that he's not ultimately going to be good. But, you know, these companies aren't going to pay all of this to some of these young players. And when you're making futures bets on them paying out later, like you're paying, pay, paying them to pan out now to be a product on the field right now. And so Spencer, who knows if he's even at OU by the end of the season, you know, and DJ gets benched. Now they bring him back because ultimately it looks like a punt was thrown up when he left the game, you know, but they got out dueled by Pickett at Pitt. And so I, I know that Clemson's had some struggles, but you thought DJ would still at least look good. But I think there'll be some lessons learned from this first round of NILs and everything that's ultimately happened where some of these companies are going to get burned a little bit. And all of a sudden, let's pump the brakes, player. Let's hold on. Let's start to get guys, start getting guys who are proven commodities. And maybe we'll wait a little bit longer before we just jump into bed uh, with some of these players. So that's those two guys. I just find it funny as I was looking through the Heisman Trophy odds. You know, have to be a starter, but both of them now have been benched after this weekend, even though DJ ultimately came back in the game. When I flip back and forth as I'm watching the games, I thought he was hurt. And, uh, you know, they just set him down for a little bit before Dabo threw him back in there. So you understand that, understand what's happening. And I think this NIL train, not that there's less money given, but I think it's smarter more money and it's more judicious money moving forward uh, so that you're not giving it to guys who are not ultimately representing you on the sideline and not on the field. Um, looking a little bit, uh, Big Ten, and Big Ten can't have nice things. Can't have nice things. James Franklin can't have nice things. You're sitting here, you're on the eve of a top 10 matchup with Ohio State. You have a chance to, you know, if you win that game, you're still controlling your own destiny in the East. 
Earlier that day, you're going to have Michigan State and Michigan score off another top 10 matchup. All you've got to do is beat Illinois, who's been one of, if not the worst team in the Big Ten and one of the worst in Power Five for the last 10 years. Now, I understand they beat Nebraska this year. This Illinois team, as Brett Bielema pointed out earlier in the week, was void of talent. They don't have the players. Penn State, while they're beat up, Sean Clifford ultimately played, didn't play terrible, and I know they have some other players out, but they're still significantly more talented than Illinois, and they're playing at home. They were coming off a bye week, so I don't want to hear this like look-ahead crap where they weren't paying attention to Illinois. They weren't necessarily you know, locked in with them. Like They had their shot. They were right there. They should have won that game. It shouldn't have been close. They should have been able to get Jahan Dotson over the top. And then when you get to overtime, not once in the seven pseudo overtimes, did you just throw, you throw one step fade to Jahan Dotson? You're trying to run all these plays, Philly, Philly, Clifford's not athletic enough. He's falling all over himself trying to catch the ball. And there's all these different issues. You have one of the best receivers in college football, James. Step back one step and just throw him the fade. Toss it out there. See if he can make a play. Maybe he gets a pass interference. Holding. Put that thing on the one-yard line. See what happens. Then you get another crack. But give your guy a chance. I can't believe at any point, if it had been one overtime or two, like you get the normals, but then once you're on the two-point conversions, at any point in time during those that they didn't throw it up, just toss it up to them to see what ultimately could have happened. They never did. And it is mind-blowing to think that you didn't give your guy a chance to do that. So James Franklin, maybe he's got one foot out the door. You know, he might be looking at, you know, LSU, I think probably USC. You know, the, the word is on the street. His wife's been on Zillow for the last three years trying to find a place to get him out of there. Um, and there's a couple of big jobs opening up. And you know what? He goes 10 and 2, 9 and 3. I mean, he, he has a good shot at getting one of those. And I think even, you know, even if he goes 8 and 4, he'll have a pretty good shot at being able to land one of those big jobs. See him a little bit more out in California than I ultimately see him in, at LSU, but who knows? We'll see what, what's offered out there and what choice he ultimately has. If he has a preference and if he is basically given the option between the sc- two schools, that's one reason. Second reason is that the Big Ten can't have nice things is Purdue. Purdue, you got it all set up. You beat Iowa. You beat them on the road. You know Now you have Wisconsin coming to home, coming to your house. A team that's very similar to Iowa. If you can get up on them early, you can get them out of running the ball. Put it on Graham Mertz to go beat you. He can't. Graham Mertz is not going to beat you. But ultimately, they're not able to do it. Wisconsin's able to pound the football to the tune of 290 yards. You lose the game 30 to 13. You have three interceptions. I mean, like it's, 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 not, it's just not a great situation. Not a great situation at all. I mean, I'm sitting here watching this, trying to figure it out. Like, why, Purdue? Why, why aren't we? We should have had some big plays to bell over the top. They should have been able to do that again. They couldn't execute, and they could not stop the run. And I know that they can't run the football. They had negative 13 yards. It takes a special type of inefficiency, a special type of just a putrid performance up front to have negative 13 rushing yards. I know sacks are included in that, but it's unbelievable that that should never happen, should never have been the case, but it ultimately was against Wisconsin. So Purdue, who just creeps into the top 25, looking good. They beat Iowa. They're controlling, you know, their own destiny. And then they ultimately lose. I mean, losing, you know, and then you've got the albatross. You know, just, you lost to Notre Dame. Like, that's a quality loss. People are going to look at that and say it's all right. But you lose now to Wisconsin. Like, Wisconsin might win the West. It's going to be a mess. We'll see. I ultimately think Minnesota probably gets it done, which isn't the best for the Big Ten. You'd still want to have Iowa win out, who's ranked ninth. But you'll take what you can get over there. But you have two ranked teams, fall to teams that they shouldn't. In the Big Ten, just as you're about ready to push through, just as you're close, you can't do it, and you throw out a stinker there. Uh, Looking a little bit, Josh Heupel, impressed what he has done at uh, at Tennessee. They're sitting there, down a score, 24-17 at the third quarter against Bama. You know, Bama's been all over the place this year. Like, they've had a lot of inconsistencies on defense. They ultimately scored 20 in the fourth and run away with that thing. But as I'm watching it, like, they're moving the football, Tennessee, that is. 
and they're able to kind of keep pace. I think the Bama offense is playing pretty well. Bryce Young's doing a pretty good job. But just defensively, there's been uncharacteristic mistakes for a Saban coach defense. And now I know what you're saying. Like, Nick Saban always gets those corrected, and he, he generally does. His teams are much better at the end of the year than they are at the beginning. Same way with Bill Belichick. It's a testament to how good of football coaches they are. But sometimes some of those mistakes, you know, if the players keep making them, either A, got to get new players, or B, find a way to, like, coach them better. And I know Nick's coaching as good as he can, and so sometimes players are just apt to make mistakes. And if you can't replace them with someone better, well, you just kind of have to live with it. So we'll see, and it's important to monitor, because Bama, there's weeks where they look nails. And they come out, and it's a big game, and they look great. In this game, I understand it's not the rivalry that it used to be, and they've won, you know, 15 straight or whatever it is, they being Bama. But there was some juice behind this game. And Bama came out, and Tennessee matched them for a half, and really through three quarters was able to kind of keep pace with Alabama, you know, and move forward. Um so Josh Heupel got that thing pointed in the right direction as well. So Tennessee, I think you've got the right guy there. Just got to stick with him and allow him to continue to recruit and give him the support he needs and understand that it's not always just going to be this linear rocket ship. There'll be some bumps in the road, some ebbs and flows as this thing begins to move on. Um, now getting to uh, the Big 12. You know, Oklahoma falls in the polls. They're jumped by Bama. You know, if it wasn't for a, a fumble late, I mean, Kansas may have had a shot to ultimately win this thing. And I hear people talking, some of these national pundits, about you know, Caleb Williams having Heisman moments against Kansas? Really? Kansas. Okay, Caleb Williams, I think, is playing pretty good. You know, he played a decent game. You know, fairly mistake-ish free. You know, he has the interception, but didn't have big passing numbers. It wasn't like he threw for 300 yards. He didn't even throw for 200. You know, and they're... They're up against it. Kansas is up on them now. Granted, they did some things really well. Kansas, that is. They survived the game, and so they win. But Kansas, I put in that same bucket as Illinois, is that they, they're battling for the bottom of the group of five. And, you know, give it up to uh, Jason Bean, I believe, the quarterback for uh, Kansas. Man, he went out there and battled. You know, obviously, they don't have the skill to be able to battle back and forth. Um, battle back and forth. With OU, but I was just amazed that OU, you know, only fell one spot. They're jumped by Bama. I mean, if you're gonna have someone jump them, I figured it'd be Bama and Ohio State that would have probably jumped them. You slide OU back to five based upon that performance. I think OU is a decent team. They just have yet to kind of put all that stuff together, and so they're battling a little bit right now. But you know, the two things I want to try to focus on here and dive in. Number one, you know, Iowa State getting it done over Oki State. Brock Purdy. Fantastic job. Played a really good game. About 300 yards passing, a couple touchdowns. Xavier Hutchinson, the dude, getting it done in a big way. Their star wide receiver. Buck 25 through the air. A couple of TDs. As the Cyclones top Okie State 24-21 and still control their destiny now in the Big 12. They'll have you know, a showdown with Oklahoma. We'll see how that all shakes out. Uh, but they've got the non-conference loss to Iowa and a loss to Baylor that was close. So Matt Campbell's team may be hitting their stride at the right time. But the big thing out of that game, Xavier Hutchinson scores a long touchdown run. They call it taunting, excessive celebration. I'm not even sure really what it is because he kind of looks over his shoulder at the five-yard line and then, you know, a little bit of a prance. But there's no taunting. There's no malice. So they throw the flags. And here's the crap of college football is the fact that it's not a dead ball foul, so it's a spot penalty. So the touchdown doesn't count. They take it from the five back to the 20. Now, Iowa State ultimately goes down and scores. And so it, and, and Hutchinson gets his touchdown. And so I kind of all as well that is end well that wins the game. But they've got to reevaluate that rule. And if you're ever an official that's going to throw the flag on that, it has to be incredibly egregious that that's going to be the case that there needs to be an excessive celebration or a taunting or whatever it is, if you're going to take sure points, sure points off the board for some team. Because if they would have lost that game, it would have been a travesty. Matt Campbell was furious, and he should have been. And you can get off, old man, get off my lawn with Xavier Hutchinson. There's times where I'm like that. I thought that was very mild, and it was ridiculous that it was even called. And it's so punitive in nature that if it's going to be called, it needs to be so over-the-top egregious 
that that's the only logical conclusion that you could come come from. And I believe, you know, Fox, they pulled in you know, Mike Pereira on that. He's like sitting there trying to find what he saw. I, I didn't see anything that was worth worthy of even a penalty, let alone a penalty that's going to take points off of the board that are sure points. That is ridiculous. Ridiculous by those officials. It was almost as if the Big 12 wanted Iowa – or wanted Okie State to win for Bedlam at the end of the season. Like, you get the call down. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Dump the flag. Dump the flag. And so they all, like I said, all is well that ends well, and they won. So it's all good. But that needs to be examined, and it needs to probably be changed to where it's a dead ball penalty if you're going to throw it and be the no fun police. Now, the overtime situation. My goodness. I don't know who thought this up, and on paper it sounds good. But going to two-point conversions after two overtimes is, is lunacy. And then you're changing sides of the field because I understand Penn State wants the student section behind them. Illinois doesn't. So whenever they get to choose of who's playing offense, who's playing defense, and you get the second choice of field position, you're walking the other end. And so seven times they walked back and forth, 200 yards. I mean, they're walking almost, and they're walking it during the main ones too, nine overtimes. You're walking basically a mile in between overtimes that are going like this. The last seven were one play, one play. And I think people thought it'd be easier to score on overtime and two point conversions. I don't know, but listen, NCAA, it, it's not that I don't like this. I don't like it. You're going to sit here and tell me it's the longest game ever. Sure. Nine overtimes, longest game ever. They're one play overtimes per possession for each team. It's two plays, two plays. Should it get to that point? Crazy town. We don't need that stuff. Go back, and I know that we want to get away from those six, seven overtime games that have taken forever, but still, that that that's the, the aberration, not the rule. That stuff happens every once in a while. It doesn't happen every year, every week. So go back to the old overtime system. I hope they analyze it and go back. I know they're going to sit here and try to say it's for player safety and all these things. They don't need to worry about that. Let the kids play. Let them decide on the field. Not just this one play nonsense. It's like deciding penalty kicks or free throws for soccer or baseball games. You don't decide a home a baseball game off home run derby at the end. Like let them go play twenty five yards and each team have their due. And I'm sure it will work itself out. Usually in an overtime, maybe three or four at the most. And on the rarest of occasion, it goes. Let that be something that we enjoy and we can celebrate. But we don't need to see this crap where they're going to do just one play, then the other team runs a play, and they march down to the other end of the field. It's ridiculous. It's nonsense. Let's try to be better than that, NCAA. Analyze the rule afterwards. Big 12, analyze your officials throwing the flag on that. NCAA, figure out that the taunting rule needs to be a dead ball, especially on a scoring play, and it needs to be egregious if it gets called. Let's figure all that stuff out and get that stuff changed and work through. And so this is it for another edition of Carbs Corner. A lot of stuff to get off the chest. A lot of great things there as we look forward to another great weekend as we're getting ready to turn this calendar to November, folks. And that's when a lot of these big rivalry games happen. And it's going to be a fun time to watch and enjoy who is going to be chasing down the college football playoff. That's it this time for According to Carbs.